today. <laughs> uh, well, we're about to find out, right? <laughs> I guess so. You haven't said that much yet. So um, here in Southern California, Carla, we have lots of uh, now lots of non-denominational churches, Calvary Chapel and other, place, other things like that. Yeah. These are all around the country now. And uh, one of the things that I find very common there, many of my friends who I grew up with as Catholics, went to Catholic school with that kind of thing, they have gone there in, instead, instead of going to a Catholic church, and they have um, very kind of well-developed arguments against worshiping as a Catholic anymore. Yes, that happens very often. A lot of times a Catholic is not getting the biblical formation and the catechetical formation that they need in their parish, and they sort of drift away, and then along comes a faith-filled, spirit-filled, good Christian, Protestant Christian who loves the Word of God, brings them into their community. They go through a very awesome, lively Bible study. The individual's intellect is enlightened, right? The will is moved, and they're finally learning something. And so that Catholic, now fallen away, begins to read Scripture within the tradition of that particular community that he or she is joining now or participating in. And very often in that process, they come across certain objections, arguments that Protestants will offer to this individual's form, uh, former Catholic belief. Right. And very often it takes a variety of shapes and sizes of how these Protestant arguments are put forward. Sometimes it's just simply, well, where is that in the Bible type of thing? You know, mm-hmm. so, you know, this particular Catholic belief is unbiblical. There's no biblical evidence for it, the assumption being that in order for it to be an authentic Christian belief, it has to have some sort of explicit reference to it in the Bible, and then for some Protestants even an implicit reference would be sufficient. Sometimes the arguments put forward, the challenges to the Catholic belief is, well, you know, uh, Psy, you Catholic now joining our Protestant community, the Catholic Church teaches doctrine X, Yeah. But the Bible teaches doctrine Y, or the Bible teaches this. So the argument takes the form of a particular biblical passage seems to undermine what you, as a former Catholic, believed in this scenario of coming into the new Protestant community. Right. But then also, too, something that's interesting, I've been writing on a little bit, a few pieces for the Camo magazine, that's the Catholic Answers magazine online, is the Protestant challenge sometimes takes the form of, okay, well, you, Cy, use Bible passage X, so to speak, yes, to support your Catholic belief, or whatever it may be, but we have an alternative explanation, right, right. of that Bible passage X. So we think it says Y, which seems to undermine Mm -hmm. your Catholic use of that Bible passage. Right. Right. So, for example, you know, one of the passages that we can get into on today's broadcast and several others, uh, I had this challenge proposed to me recently this uh, last week. I was doing a mission, Advent mission, in Iowa, Louisiana. So I was able to go home and get oh, some good right. food, by the way. <laughs> How was and that, so by the way? My, happy meal? Oh, I was a happy man, so <laughs> I, <laughs> My belly was satisfied. Uh-huh. But, uh, but one, of, one of the young men there uh, asked me the question, because the talk was on salvation. And I was appealing to James 2.24, where St. James says, you see that we are justified we are not we are justified by works and not by faith alone and i was using that text as we have in our catholic tradition for many centuries now to give the biblical evidence that it's our salvation is not a matter of faith alone but both faith and works works come into play when we're talking about this ongoing progressive stage of salvation and our final ultimate uh, dimension of salvation to be saved in the end to enter into the beatific vision that works are necessary so one young man asked the question well carlo what do you say to someone who challenges our use of James 2.24 to substantiate our belief of faith and works with regard to salvation or justification. What do you say to someone who challenges that use of the passage in saying that the justification that James speaks of in James 2.24 is not justification or salvation in the sight of God, but justification in the sight of man. That is, by doing or performing the good works, our 
our Christianity, me being a Christian, is confirmed in the sight of men, in your sight, so that you now know I am a Christian. I so see. I'm sort of justified in your sight. I am authentically a Christian. So this, on the certain, then some, many Protestants will use uh, this argument to try and undermine our use of James 2.24. And so how do we respond to that is the question, right? Well, first of all, just very briefly here, because I know we're probably fixing to have to go to a break, but the context is what tells us the type of justification that James is speaking okay. of. Because in James chapter 2, verses, verse 14 and forward, James speaks of salvation. He says, if a man says he has faith but has not works, can his faith save him? So James clearly, and then he goes on to describe the type of works, namely corporal works of mercy. He says, if a man is ill-clad and lack of daily food, and you say to him, well, go and be warmed and be filled, but you don't do anything to help him out, well, then your faith is dead, right? Your faith is not going to save you. Right. So James is clearly talking about whether our faith can save us, namely salvation, which yes. has to do with being put right. in right relationship with God. The salvation that James is speaking of here in James 2.14 and forward is not a sort of right relationship with man. It's not sort of being confirmed as a Christian in the sight of man. He's talking about being confirmed as a Christian of right relationship in the sight of God. Right, right. Be because he's speaking of salvation. And he makes it even clearer. He says, if uh, faith by itself in verse 17, if it has no works, is dead. The death that James is speaking of here is not referring to, well, my faith has no, uh, is not alive in your sight, <laughs> yeah, right? Right. If faith is dead, as James is speaking of, we can dead infer... Dead is dead. Dead is dead. <laughs> he, we can infer from that he's referring to it being dead in the sight of God. Yeah. It's not alive in the sight of God. It's not going to save me. And in fact, if you go and jump to verse 26, James will compare faith without works to a corpse without the soul. So just as a right. body is dead without the spirit that gives it life, so too faith without works is dead. And so the death that he's talking about is being void of that salvific relationship with God. So you can believe all you want, but if you don't have the works of love, if you don't have that charity animating that faith, in no way will it contribute to you standing in right relationship with God, to being in right relationship with God. And finally, Sai, we could also respond to this objection by pointing out how in James chapter 2, Right around verses 19 to 22, James draws a parallel between our justification by works and, of course, faith with works, and Abraham's justification. Because mm -hmm. he'll say, was not our father Abraham justified by works, by offering his son Isaac in obedience to God's command? And Abraham was not justified in the sight of man. The type of yes, justification right. that James is talking about with regard to Abraham is not a justification in the sight of man. It is a justification in the sight of God. There was no one there on Mount Moriah where Abraham offered Isaac in sacrifice for him to be justified in the sight of. Right. It was just Isaac, and now somebody could say, well, he was justified in the sight of Isaac, but that just that's a stretch. Boy, is it. Yeah. That's right. Abraham becomes justified in the sight of God, and in in fact, James tells us in uh, verse 23 that Abraham, in performing the work of obedience, of offering his son Isaac, Abraham became a friend of God. And so notice he doesn't become a friend of man, <laughs> right? right? Or somebody that's witnessing the action of obedience to God's command, but he becomes a friend of God, which would indicate his justification has to do with his relationship with God. And many scholars point out that this is uh, references or parallels like for Second uh, Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, where it talks about Abraham is God's friend, and Isaiah 41, verse 8, where it talks about the offspring of Abraham, who is God's friend. God is speaking and refers to Abraham as his friend. So Abraham 
in performing a work of love, of obedience, becomes justified, according to James, in the sight of God, inasmuch as he becomes a friend of God. He's it's reckoned to yes. him as righteousness, justification. He's justified. And that's the justification that James compares our justification to when we perform these works of love that he speaks of in James 2 verse 14 and following, namely, the corporal works of mercy. Carlo Broussard is our guest today on Catholic Answers Live. We're not able to take calls today because today we had to pre-record this show for various reasons having to do with our schedule at Catholic Answers. Protestant challenges to Catholic beliefs, particularly those biblical uh, passages, Carlo, that seem to be very Catholic, but there must be Protestant arguments about those, and it, sometimes it's Jesus doing things that seem to be very Catholic things that Jesus is doing. Sometimes it's uh, the writers of the New Testament seeming to support Catholic ideas. How do Protestants respond to those? What are those? What, wh how, what do they make of those? And then how do ca Catholics answer those objections? More Protestant challenges on Catholic beliefs with Carlo Broussard right after this on Catholic Answers Live. Catholic Answers Live. Did you know that subscriptions to Catholic Answers Magazine are now available in digital format? That's right, you spoke and we listened. And now you can give digital gift subscriptions of Catholic Answers Magazine to friends, family, high school and college students, seminarians, even your pastor, anyone on your list. A subscription to the digital edition of Catholic Answers Magazine makes a great gift for someone overseas, including deployed servicemen and women. Catholic Answers Magazine is the perfect gift for anyone who wants to learn more about his or her faith in a steady and near effortless way. Turn the people on your Christmas list into spreaders of the gospel by getting them a subscription to the digital edition of Catholic Answers Magazine today. Visit catholicanswersmagazine.com to sign up friends and family. Share the faith, defend the faith. Catholic Answers Magazine from Catholic Answers, the most trusted name in Catholic apologetics and evangelization. Catholic Answers Live is brought to you in part by CatholicSingles.com, the website for Catholics who want to meet others who share their Catholic values for faith, fellowship, and love. You can learn more at CatholicSingles.com. Catholic Answers Live thanks CatholicSingles.com for their generous support. The Catholic Answers Minute. I'm Father Vincent Serpa. In Matthew 11:16, Jesus said, To what shall I compare this generation? He then compared it to children who antagonize each other with expectations impossible to fulfill. John the Baptist fasted and abstained from wine, and they said he was possessed by a demon. Jesus came eating and drinking, and they called him a glutton and a drunkard. But wisdom is vindicated by its works. Jesus was always concerned about reality, and not merely how things appeared, and he still is. Talk is cheap. Jesus came eating and drinking. He also suffered and died on the cross for us, where his words are vindicated and heaven has been opened to us. The lover is the one who is willing to sacrifice. He designed us to be lovers, to put ourselves out for others. That's how we know that we love them. I'm Father Vincent Serpa for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. We're not taking live calls. However, we invite you to stay with us and enjoy the broadcast. This is Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Sai Kelly, your host, Carlo Broussard, our guest. And I suppose, Carlo, there's a certain way where you can, as, if you, as you read scriptures, you can say, well, there are certain scriptures that a Protestant would be really excited about. Say that one, see that really. And there are certain ones that Catholics would be really excited about. That one right there, right? <laughs> right, right. And so uh, Catholics have to have answers to the ones that Protestants would get excited about. Sure. And then uh, Protestants have, have to have answers to the ones Catholics would get excited about. That's, and that's so right. those are the ones we're addressing because th there are some passages in the scripture, and and I'm sure a Protestant would admit this, I mean, uh, because we can admit it about uh, other passages that have to do with, Pro that seem to support Protestantism, there's some that where you just look at the plain meaning of them and go, that's a really Catholic message right, <laughs> right there. Right. And so you got to have something to say about that, and so, to uh, especially to, to those who have maybe left the Catholic Church to worship in a Protestant uh, house of worship, um, uh, and to embrace a Protestant uh, understanding of Christianity, well, you need to know that there are Catholic responses to these, you know, these uh, uh, intellectual challenges. We're not saying that they're just evil challenges. These right. are intellectual challenges we have to address in an intelligent way. I want to uh, address another one uh, with you, Carlo. Okay. Uh, in uh, John's Gospel, um, the the um, 
apostles are given the uh, is am I right about this the, the authority to forgive that is correct okay and that's in the 20th chapter of John's gospel verse 23 verse 23 okay and so that seems uh, to really support the Catholic view that there's a priesthood that can forgive sins can actually forgive sins in the name of Christ yeah it's the passage that you know Christians have always turned to from the very beginning mm -hmm. to substantiate uh, the claim, the Catholic claim, that Jesus instituted the sacrament of confession. And as you mentioned, Sai, this would also tie into uh, the apostles being priests. In as yeah. much as they have the authority to forgive sins, well, then it would follow from that that they're a priest, because that's a priestly ministry. Uh, but what about the antecedent? Namely, that they have the authority to forgive sins. Right. And for the Catholic, I mean, you know, like there's no Bible passage clearer for the sacrament of confession than this one. If you forgive the sins of, of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But our Protestant brothers and sisters, uh, you know, they, they're, they're not going to they're not going to go down without swinging, right? Yeah. They have a very reasonable uh, response to it, you know, to offer an alternative explanation that we need to consider, as you uh, put it earlier when you were coming in from the break. And that is, our Protestant brothers and sisters will say, well, what Jesus meant here, Jesus' instruction was merely to preach the forgiveness of sins. Uh -huh. Not necessarily to forgive, but to preach the forgiveness of sins. And the reason for this claim is that Luke's parallel account in Luke 24, 47, uh, Luke tells us that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and, it said, and he said to them, Thus it is written that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. So according to this objection, Luke and John record the same event, but they express the instruction in different ways. And Luke's version is shedding light on what Jesus really meant in John's account uh, when he said, forgive and retain. What he really means is that the apostles are to go out and to tell people about the forgiveness of sins and to preach the gospel message and to tell people if they respond to the gospel message, their sins will be forgiven. And if they reject the gospel message, well, then their sins will not be forgiven. In other words, their sins will be retained. So that's the objection. So how do we respond? Well, if we read carefully, Sai, we discover that the sequence of events that Luke is recording in Luke 24, in which we find this command to preach the forgiveness of sins, and it is true, that's there in Luke 24, um, particularly verse 47, to preach the forgiveness of sins. But the sequence of events in which that instruction is con included, if you read carefully, we discover that it's not, the, it's not the same event as what John records in the upper room uh, in see. John 20, 23. And we have a few hints of this. For example, it's interesting that Luke, in the verses preceding this sequence of events in which we have the command to preach the forgiveness of sins. In the preceding verses, Luke, Luke gives us time cues to tie the series of events into Easter Sunday. Like, for example, in Luke 24, verse 1, he says, on the first day of the week at early dawn, okay? Yeah. So that's Sunday, Easter Sunday. Then in verse 13, that very day, verse 33, that same hour. So Luke's recording various things Jesus said and did on Easter Sunday mm -hmm. via these time cues. But what's interesting, Sai, is in verse 44, which begins the sequence of events in which we find this command to preach the forgiveness of sins. Okay. Luke drops the time cues and starts employing a sort of rapid fire narrating with conjunctions like and. So he says, and then he said, verse 44, and then he said, and then he said this, and then he did that. So there's this rapid succession all the way to verse 53 of various instructions that Jesus gives the apostles. So by virtue of dropping the time cues and this rapid fire narration of a sequence of events gives us a clue that Luke is summarizing here a series of events that took place after Easter Sunday. Okay. Now what period of time is that? It's the 40 days, according to Luke, it's the 40 days that Jesus spent with the apostles before the time of the ascension. Mm 
And Luke makes this tie, he connects this sequence of events to that 40 days in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. What we find there is in Acts 1, 1 through 10, the same sort of instructions that Jesus gave during the 40 days he was with the apostles is the same list of instructions, some of the same instructions that Luke records in Luke 24, 44 and following. So for example, we know that during the 40 days, according to Luke in Acts 1, Jesus tells the apostles that they're going to preach to all nations. Yes, okay. They're going to begin in Jerusalem, right? And they're going to receive power from the Father on high. These are all the things that Luke tells us Jesus told the apostles while he was with them for the 40 days up until the ascension, which took place after Easter Sunday, right? Well, in Luke 24, that sequence of events where we find Jesus giving the command to preach the forgiveness of sins, we find the same items. Within that sequence of events, to preach the forgiveness of sins, Jesus also tells the apostles, according to Luke, that they're going to preach to all nations, they're going to start in Jerusalem, and they're going to receive the power from the Father on high. So the way Luke makes these connections, we can conclude reasonably that the sequence of events that Luke is telling us about in this rapid-fire narration, right, yes. in which we find this command to preach the forgiveness of sins, is the same set of instructions that Jesus gave the apostles during the 40-day period prior to his ascension that Luke tells us about in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. The bottom line, side being, is that the sequence of events it, that include the instruction to preach the forgiveness of sins is not the same event or set of instructions that Jesus gives in the upper room on Easter Sunday, namely the instruction to forgive and retain. So the objection struggles to even get off the ground because they're not the same event, which the objection assumes. I see. And trying yeah. to undermine the Catholic use of John chapter 20, verse 23. So it's not the same event, therefore it's not the same instruction being given. In the upper room, the instruction is to forgive and retain. The sequence of events that Luke's recording in Luke 24 is to preach the forgiveness of sins, which leads us to another line of response, you know, because our Protestant friends Psy, might say, oh, well, maybe they're not the same event, but maybe they mean the same. Yeah. So maybe they're not the same. We'll grant you that, Carlo. They're not the same event, but, but maybe they still mean the same thing. Like when Jesus said, forgive and retain, what he meant mm -hmm. was to preach the forgiveness of sins. Tell people that if they believe, God will forgive them. If they don't believe, God will not forgive them. But the problem with that, Psy, is that nowhere in the immediate context of John 20, in the upper room, do we find any mention of preaching. So you have no immediate context to support right, that right. interpretation. In other words, to forgive means to preach. And secondly, the actions that the apostles are to perform are not preaching, but to forgive yeah. and to retain. Those are the clear actions they are to perform, and we'll pick it up on the other side of the break, right? Carlo Broussard is our guest. We're addressing Protestant challenges to Catholic beliefs. More on that right after this on Catholic Answers Live. EWTN is now on Twitter. Get short, timely messages from EWTN on your computer or cell phone. It's easy to stay up to date on a wide variety of topics. Pro-life news, Vatican announcements, catechesis, apologetics, the latest EWTN programming, and more. You can link to EWTN on Twitter from our homepage or go to twitter.com slash EWTN. At work, at home, at school, and on the road, stay connected to your world with EWTN's Twitter page. Did the Catholic Church add books to the Bible? Or did Protestants remove seven books from the Old Testament? Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger takes you on a fact-filled tour through the history of the Bible, revealing the whole story behind the lost books of the Protestant Old Testament. With the latest information and discourse on crucial issues, Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger is a book that belongs in the library of every serious student of Scripture. And as a special bonus, if you order online, we'll add an ebook copy of 15 Myths, Mistakes, and Misrepresentations about the Deuterocanon to your order absolutely free. 
Get your free ebook today. Order your copy of Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger by logging on to our online shop at shop.catholic.com. Did you know that subscriptions to Catholic Answers Magazine are now available in digital format? That's right, you spoke and we listen. And for the first time, you can now give digital gift subscriptions to friends, family members, seminarians, your priest, or anyone on your list. When you get right down to it, what other gift has the potential to touch hearts and reap eternal rewards? Log on today to CatholicAnswersMagazine.com and sign up friends and family alike for a gift that is bound to make a difference in their lives and the lives of those they meet. Share the faith. Defend the faith. Catholic Answers Magazine from Catholic Answers, the most trusted name in Catholic apologetics. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I am Cy Kellett, your host, and don't forget to join Radio Club. Let me just stress that again. Don't forget to join Radio Club. It's free, it's easy, and we send you stuff. Right now, we're sending out a free MP3 of Jimmy Aiken's talk, what the Reformation was all about at our most recent conference. Other ones come throughout the year, those free MP3s or uh, various other free things that we try to get to you. Uh, and we don't bother you that much. We send you a weekly email uh, that includes our newsletter on what's happening here at the radio department of Catholic Answers. Just go to catholic.com slash radio club and sign up. It's that easy. catholic.com slash radio club. We want to be your friend. Uh, Carlo Broussard is our guest this hour, and we're discussing Protestant challenges to Catholic beliefs. We're taking those passages of the Bible, or some of those passages of the Bible, that seem very Catholic in their intent, and addressing uh, Protestant objections to those. Uh, we were talking about the fact that Jesus seems to commission the apostles to go and forgive sins, and the objection is, well, uh, no, what he was doing was commissioning them to go and preach the forgiveness of sins. Correct. You had a few more points you wanted to make on that. Yeah, so first of all, as we talked about prior to the break, we showed how the reason why our Protestant friends will make that claim doesn't hold water because they often c try to compare it to Luke's uh, alleged parallel account of that instruction and that event in Luke 24, 47, but that doesn't hold water because it's not the same event, right? But then prior to the break, I was trying to articulate how even within the immediate context of John 20, 23, there is no hint of preaching, first of all. Secondly, the wording itself doesn't lend to an interpretation of this instruction being to preach, because Jesus says, whatever you forgive, whatever you retain, those are the performative words, those are the actions that the apostles are to perform. And telling, t you know, to say that to tell someone to forgive is the same as telling them to go and preach. That's a stretch. You're asking one to take the language of to forgive in an unnatural sense. I mean, if I tell my four-year-old daughter, go forgive your brother for pushing you, I don't mean go and tell him that if he repents, God will forgive him, right? Or go and tell him yes, that if right. he believes in the gospel, God will forgive him. No, I'm telling her to go and administer, you know, to pardon him for his offense type right. of thing. So to say that forgive means preach, it's, it's an unreasonable request for us to take the language in an unnatural sense. And since there's no evidence in the context to suggest otherwise, we're, it's reasonable to conclude, we're justified in concluding that when Jesus said to forgive, that's what he meant, to forgive. And furthermore, check this out, Cy. Why, if Jesus would have meant what the objection suggests, namely go and tell people that if they believe in the gospel, God will forgive them. If they don't believe in the gospel, God will not forgive them. Well, then why does Jesus say the apostles will forgive and not forgive? Notice it's not, Jesus says nothing about God forgiving and retaining. Jesus says the apostles are the ones who are going to judge whether to forgive or to retain. And then finally, you know, just to wrap this up, Cy, si, it's, it's, it's important to note that Jesus well, first of all, let me just say the objection fails to make the connection between the mission that the Father sent Jesus on yes. and the mission that Jesus is sending the apostles on. Because if you notice in the text, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Oh, and okay. then he says, if you forgive the sins of, of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, did the Father send Jesus merely to preach the forgiveness of sins? 
No, indeed. No, he no. Jesus he, forgave sins. Amen. That's and, what got him in trouble with the Pharisees. <laughs> that's right. Like Mark that, yeah. chapter two, right, verses five through ten. Boy, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees think in their the scribes think in their mind and in their heart, who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. Jesus didn't come merely to preach the forgiveness of sins. He actually forgave sins. And Jesus unequivocally, right, he clearly states the connection, makes the connection between what the Father sent him to do and what he's sending the apostles to do. As the Father sent me, even so I send you. So as the Father sent Jesus to actually forgive sins, he's sending the apostles to actually forgive sins. Now, of course, God alone is the source of the forgiveness of sins, but it's clear Jesus is transferring that authority, or to state it differently, is going to empower the apostles, allow them to participate in his, in his power, to be the instruments by which God intends to forgive people's sins. Carlo Broussard is our guest, and Carlo, you know, um, I, I, the thing I think people should know, and, and perhaps I think it comes through when you talk, we're not just trying to win an argument here. The idea is that Christ has given extraordinary gifts in the Catholic Church, and among them is the reception of the Eucharist, the most extraordinary gift. And in fact, we, we, it would, Christ wants everyone to have that, everyone. Amen. To have All the, the seven sacraments are right. great gifts, right. and as you mentioned, the greatest gift being himself in the Eucharist. And so these are realities right, right. Uh, that Jesus intends for us to know and to participate in. Right. And so as you mentioned, it's not about just winning the argument, it's about coming to know what is real, yeah. and what does Jesus intend for us for our human happiness, right? So there, the and the scriptures, the gospels are profoundly Eucharistic in many ways. I, I would suggest to you, but that the, so you would say, well, that argues for the Catholic uh, view of Eucharist. But uh, let's take, for example, Luke's version uh, of the um, of the, the institution Supper, of right. the of institution the, of, narrative of the Eucharist. Well, uh, this is my body. This is my blood. What could possibly, how could there be an objection to the fact that Christ is giving us his body and blood at that moment? Yes, yes. So Jesus clearly says, This is my body, this is my blood. But our Protestant friends will object and say, Well, okay, well, wait a minute, Carlo. According to both Mark and Matthew's version of the institution narrative, they have this line that they put in their institution narrative that Jesus speaks of. After the words of consecration, Jesus says, I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the objection goes, well, notice it's after the words of consecration. If the substance in the chalice after the words of consecration, where Jesus is real and substantial blood, then why in the world does he refer to that substance as the fruit of the vine? Yes. If it were his blood, then it would seem he wouldn't refer to it as the fruit of the vine. So apparently, after the words of consecration, it's still wine in that chalice, and not the substantial blood of Jesus, as Catholics say, right? Right. So how do we respond to that? Well, uh, the first thing as to consider, as you pointed out, in Luke's version, Luke actually puts the fruit of the vine statement before the words of consecration. Okay. Not after. So Luke's account is different here. There's a Luke diverts from Mark's account, and Matthew, and according to scholars, Matthew's pulling from Mark here. So Luke is diverting from Mark's order of things. And one plausible explanation for this is that, according to evidence from the first century, it's it was known in the first century among Christians that Mark didn't write things in an exact chronological order. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a second-century Christian bishop named Papias, and we get this from the church historian Eusebius, he's quoting this bishop, Papias, who records the words of John the Presbyter. He was an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry in the first century, saying this, Mark, having become an interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, though not in order, whatsoever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ, close quote. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a, 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 a sight, insight, right? It's a window that we're, by which we have insight that among the first century Christians, it was known that Mark was an interpreter of Peter, first of all, so Mark's gospel is basically Peter's gospel, mm -hmm. penned by Mark, right? And that Mark put down things that weren't in chronological order. Now, here's the key, Sai. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, 
when he's in his prologue, he's setting out the purpose for him writing this narrative of Jesus' life. He says that he's going to write an orderly account. Oh, okay. So it's possible that Mark diver- excuse me, Luke diverts from Mark's order of the words of Jesus in the institution narrative in order to clarify, to make an orderly account and to put right, so to speak, uh, the exact ordering of these words of Jesus. And if that is the case, and what Jesus said, and speaking about the fruit of the vine, came before the words of consecration, as Luke is telling us, well, then the objection can't even get off the ground. Okay. So the appeal to the fruit of the vine language would be futile in trying to undermine the Catholic use or the Catholic understanding of Jesus' real substantial blood being in the chalice at the Last Supper. So that's one way that we can respond to this, by appealing to Luke's version of it and saying, well, Luke's giving us an orderly account, and thus the fruit of the vine didn't come after the words of consecration. It It came came before. before. Okay. But let's just grant for argument's sake, Sai, that the language of the fruit of the vine did come after the words of consecration. Would this undermine the Catholic understanding of the text? It wouldn't. And the reason is, is because it's, the, listen, the biblical authors were very, it was very common for biblical authors to describe things according to the senses, right? Yeah. And that's a common thing throughout all of sacred scripture. We call it phenomenological language. Yeah. It's language according to the phenomenon, right? So the weatherman in the morning does this, right? He says, the sun will rise at 6 a.m. and it'll set at 6 p.m. Is he intending to, is he advocating that he is a geocentrist? Is he mm-hmm. advocating for geocentrism? Of course not, right? Right, exactly, yeah. So, so he's, a, he's just simply describing things according to what appears to the senses. And the Bible does this often as well. For example, death is described as sleep. Now, why would that be? Because it looks like the person sleeping, right? According to Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, death is described as sleep describing something according to what appears to the senses. Even angels and God himself, right, are described as men, a manifestation of God, are described as men in Genesis chapter 18, uh, verse 2 and verses following. So you remember the, the three men that Abraham encounters there, and they're described as men, but we're told that Two of the three are angels, and one of the three is the Lord himself. Even Tobit, in Tobit 5, 2 through 4, would describe an angel as a man. So it's common in Scripture to describe things according to what appears to the senses. We even use it in our common parlance language, in common parlance. And so for Jesus to refer to his blood in the chalice, his precious blood, as the fruit of the vine, it doesn't follow from that that he's saying it's only wine, because it could very well be that he's describing his precious blood according to how it appears to the senses, namely, as wine. And that's just simply employing phenomenological language. And thus, yet another way that we can answer this objection from our Protestant friends. we got to take a break, but when we come back, I'd like to do some more objections to the uh, institution of the Eucharist. Indeed, let's do it. Uh, Carla Broussard, our guest, we are addressing Protestant challenges to Catholic beliefs, uh, especially uh, those scripture passages that seem to support the Catholic view. Protestants have an argument about those. We would just like to respond to those here in a respectful and hopefully charitable way. Uh, We'll be back with more of that after this on Catholic Answers Live. Hello, this is Bishop Jeffrey Montfort and Bishop of the Diocese of Steubenville. Make sure you keep it on Catholic Answers Live. God bless you. Did you know that there's a place you can turn first that features the newest, most exciting Catholic resources, as well as a huge selection by some of the best Catholic authors and speakers on the planet? It's our online store at shop.catholic.com. All of our offerings are time-tested and apologist-vetted, and trustworthy and faithful to the teachings of the Catholic Church. And, of course, the lights are always on for your shopping convenience. It's one-stop shopping made affordable and easy. Shop.catholic.com You've heard that St. Paul Street Evangelization supports hundreds of teams of evangelists sharing the good news. 
But did you know that some of these teams are public prayer stations? Set up a sign on the sidewalk and offer prayer and encouragement to those you encounter. Everyone needs prayer. Try this new method of witnessing to Jesus. Contact St. Paul Street Evangelization to get started at streetevangelization.com. That's streetevangelization.com. I met my husband in my first year of college. We both came from strong Catholic families and wanted lots of children. After three years of marriage and still not pregnant, we felt our dream of a big family slipping away. My sister encouraged us to visit our local Catholic store and get a novena to St. Gerard. When we arrived, we were unsure about our need, but the staff was kind and helpful. Wow, what an incredible Catholic store. They encouraged us to pray and trust in God's providence. One worker told us stories of other couples, just like us, who were desperate to start a family. Four years and two children later, we have been back to that incredible Catholic store for baby, baptism, and toddler gifts. God bless the staff at that incredible Catholic store. An incredible Catholic store in your area can be found at IncredibleCatholicStore.com. The Incredible Catholic Store, transforming the world one soul at a time. Homeschool Connections, an online provider of courses for your Catholic homeschool, is a sponsor of Catholic Answers Live. Homeschool Connections' website is homeschoolconnections.com. We're not taking live calls. However, we invite you to stay with us and enjoy the broadcast. This is Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to another fantastic Friday show on Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken coming up next hour. We're going to talk about uh, messianic prophecies. Uh, the New Testament certainly claims a great deal of the Old Testament uh, included these prophecies of Jesus himself. Is that true? Can we support that? And how, what are we to make of messianic prophecy? And uh, and importantly, have all the messianic prophecies been fulfilled? We'll look into that with Jimmy Aiken next hour. This hour, we're looking at Protestant challenges to Catholic faith with Carlo Broussard. We we'll hope for we're doing so in a respectful way, but uh, there are lots of things uh, that uh, in the scriptures, in the Gospels, in the rest of the New Testament, would uh, that have a certain Catholic flair to them. Um, so uh, as Catholics, we might say, see, that proves the case, but no, Protestants have an answer for those, and we try to address those answers uh, with further investigation with Carlo today. Carlo, um, in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, uh, the Bread of Life discourse, right. uh, uh, the, uh, uh, first of all, uh, just an, an absolutely amazing discourse. I mean, you can't... Sure. I mean, Protestant, Catholic, anyone who knows Christ as the Son of God has to marvel at the Bread of Life discourse. Uh, it happens that people are following Jesus in, in large part because he just did a miracle involving bread. Right. And they, they're, they're, more miracles, more miracles. And right. he, he doesn't give them more miracles. He gives them a really hard teaching, and we know it's a hard teaching because they Maybe leave. Amen. <laughs> they Amen. Leave. Except for those who didn't have faith in the miracles, but had faith in the person. Amen. Those who loved and, and followed Jesus because they believed in him. Um, okay, so doesn't the Bread of Life discourse, doesn't that pretty much seal the deal? And this is the Eucharist, isn't it? Right. I often like to say, you know, what the hammer is to Thor, yeah. John 6 <laughs> is to the Catholic, right? <laughs> because any any time... Anytime, yeah. I, I've often spoken with Catholics who are into their faith and into apologetics and stuff, and they always tell me how when they sort of get pinned down by a Protestant, you know, and metaphorically speaking here, right? Yeah. In, in a discussion where they don't know how to answer, they'll always say, oh, yeah, well, what about John, John 6? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about John 6, right? right? Where Jesus says, for our listeners' sake, where Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Then he goes on to iterate the same teaching like six different times in verses 54 through 58. But our Protestant friends are quick to respond, and, and it's, it requires a legitimate answer, because it's on the surface it seems to be a response that could possibly undermine our Catholic interpretation of the Bread of Life discourse. And, and the objection is from John 6, 63, where Jesus says, it is the Spirit that gives life, the flesh is of no avail, the words that I've spoken to you or spirit and life. So the Protestant will argue, well, if the flesh were of no avail, well then why would Jesus intend for us to eat his flesh? Right. And if his words are spiritual, or spirit and life, well then that means they are to be taken symbolically. Yes, right. So the idea is that here, 
Jesus is clarifying his prior teaching to eat his flesh and drink his blood, which merited from both the Jews and his disciples a response of like, what in the world are you talking about, man? Like, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So the Protestant will argue that in verse 63, when Jesus speaks of the flesh having no avail, his words of spirit and life, he's clarifying for them that no, you're taking me wrong, and, or, and you're misunderstanding me. I do not mean it literally. I mean it symbolically, etc. So how do we respond to this? Is Jesus clarifying their literal thoughts with this uh, text here in verse 63? And my answer would be no. First of all, we would have to call into Je Jesus' competence as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> if Jesus is clarifying here in an absolute way, well then, we would have to call in, into question his competence, precisely because all of the disciples leave him after that teaching. Right. It's after Jesus said, my words are spirit and life, the flesh is of no avail, that all of the disciples pick up and say, see you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus never calls him back. He lets him go, and then he turns to the twelve and says, will you leave me also? To which Peter responds, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So that's the first response. Secondly, Sai, you know, when, when that, the word spirit in Greek, pneuma, doesn't mean symbol. Just because Jesus says, my words are spirit, yeah. it doesn't follow from that, that his words are to be taken symbolically, mm -hmm. right? For example, in John 4, 24, we're told God is a spirit. Does that mean God is just a symbol? No. For example, another example would be Hebrews 1, 14. We're told that angels are spirits. Does that mean angels are mere symbols? Of course not. Mm -hmm. So just because the word spirit, pneuma in Greek, is used, it doesn't mean that Jesus' words are symbolic. That's just a, a false association of the two words. And then finally, when Jesus speaks of the flesh, he's not referring to his flesh, because he just told us six times in verses 54 through 58 that we have to eat his flesh in order to go to heaven. He's not going to now say, well, my flesh is of no avail. <laughs> yeah, that's a direct contradiction of what he just said. Amen. Yeah, okay. And Jesus wouldn't contradict himself. So what does Jesus mean when he speaks of the flesh? Well, in biblical theology, in the New Testament especially, we, we come to understand that the flesh, the flesh is an idiom to describe man's nature, human nature, apart from grace. Human nature that's not animated by the Spirit uh, of God. Okay. We see, for example, in Mark 14, 38, Jesus speaks of the Spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Romans 8, 1 through 14 is the key text where St. Paul talks about the flesh apart from God's grace, right, apart from the Spirit of God, will reap nothing, right? You will be right. able to reap nothing if you're working only and living according to the flesh, man's nature apart from grace, apart from the Spirit of God, right? You have to be animated by God's Spirit, animated by charity, in order for any of the things you do in the body to merit salvation, right, and bring yes. about your salvation. And he would also talk about this idea in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, through chapter 3, verse 1, where he talks about the spiritual man, that is the man that's animated by the Spirit of God. So when Jesus speaks of his words being spirit and life, or excuse me, when Jesus speaks of the flesh being of no avail, he's referring to human nature apart from God's grace. That is to say, man by himself, without God's grace, will not be able to believe in this teaching to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Right. We have to be moved by the Spirit of God, and in fact, Jesus sandwiches his bread of life discourse between two statements in verse 44 and verse 65, connoting the same idea. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me unless it's granted him by my Father. Those are the, the two bookends in between which we have the commands to eat his flesh and drink his blood. So without the Father's help, without God's grace, without the Spirit of God, we will be unable to accept this teaching with faith because they are, this teaching is of the Spirit, and so it is only by the power of the Spirit that we can accept the teaching on the Eucharist with faith. So Jesus is speaking about the Eucharist here. He, he is speaking that, that he, when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he means it 
literally. That's right. He's not speaking metaphorically, merely metaphorically. He's speaking literally. There is a reality that we're going to be partaking of his flesh and blood. How we're going to do this and in what yeah. way, there's some mystery, and Jesus does leave a little mystery, and he gives a hint at there's, that there's more to it when he appeals to his ascension. What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Right. before which, according to biblical scholar Brent Petrie, is an indication that we're not going to be feeding upon his dead corpse yeah. and, and partaking of pieces of his dead body, which would be cannibalism, but right. that we would be eating his flesh and blood resurrected and ascended into heaven in a glorified state. And Jesus reveals the manner or the mode in which we're going to do that at the Last Supper when he shows us we're going to partake of his flesh and blood under the appearance of bread and wine. Okay, I only got a couple minutes left with okay. you, Carlos. So, but Jesus also refers to himself as the vine. That's right. John as, 15, 5. As the door. John 10, 9. Yeah. So it, he has these other modes of, how do I know that th that's not what he's doing here? That's right. If I, if I don't take him literally in those passages, right. then why should I be taking him literally here, right? Yeah. And the key, Sai, is the difference in the audience's response. Notice in John 10, 9, the audience doesn't say, how can this man be made out of wood? Yeah, how can he be a door? Right, right. right. John yeah. 15, 5. How can this man be a plant or a vegetable, right? Mm -hmm. And nowhere do we have any indication that his audience is taking him literally in those passages. And that's, a, that's clearly juxtaposed or cl is clearly different than how the audience responds to Jesus in John 6. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, the Jews say in verse 53 there. Or in verse 60, the disciple says, this is a horror teaching. Who can accept it? So the audience response is different in both in these different scenarios. So we know that in the door example and the vine example, the audience is not taking Jesus literally. So there's no need for him to clarify or whatever. They understand him to be speaking metaphorically. But the audience understands Jesus literally in the Bread of Life discourse in John 6. And rather than Jesus correcting their literal understanding, he actually affirms it by reiterating the teaching six times in verses 54 through 68, 58, yeah. and letting the disciples walk away there in verse 66, and even turning to the 12 and saying, are you going to leave too? And to, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, says Peter. Right. And that's what we have to say as well. Amen. He doesn't say, I get it, Lord. I'm with you. I get it 100. He's more like, mm, uh, I, I trust you. Amen. Brother. I don't know what you're that's talking it. about, but that's I trust it. you. Uh, but he does come to know what Jesus is talking in line about. In the Last Supper. Uh, again, Jimmy Aiken will be here next hour. We're going to talk about a Messianic Prophecy. Carlo Broussard, it's always a delight to have you here. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, si. It was a pleasure, my friend. Another great hour with Carlo Broussard. We'll see you right after this on Catholic Answers Live.